Well, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is John Allen, uh, and I'm president of the Brookings Institution, and it is my sincere pleasure to welcome you to today's event, hosted by our Race, Prosperity, and Inclusion Initiative, and it's entitled How We Rise, Policy Solutions to Upend Structural Racism and Inequality. This event coincides with the official launch of our new policy blog, which is also entitled How We Rise which is focused on structural racism, and creating a more equitable society for all. Now this topic is in my mind, the most important issue in America today and has its origins even before the founding of our nation. Put it plainly, slavery was America's original sin and it was not solved by the founders of the American Republic nor was it solved by the framers of the constitution and it was not ended nor ultimately settled by the horrendous and bloody conflict that would become the American Civil War. Indeed, in many ways, the most odious vestiges of slavery have persisted in America even to this day in the form of systemic racism baked into nearly every aspect of our society and who we are as a people. And what's more, that includes racism and unequal treatment for a wide range of Americans. So the reality of this history has been on stark display in recent weeks, not just by pointing to those who've been its victims, but by the rich diversity of voices shouting for change. From the terrible killings of George Floyd and Ahmed Aubrey, to the countless untold acts of racism that take place every day across America, these are the issues that are defining the moment. Just as our response will define who we are in the 21st century and who we will be as a people today and beyond. Truly, this is about the very nature of our national soul and it is at stake. And we all have a deep responsibility to be part of the solution. And to that end, I am pleased to share today that the issues associated with race, racism, equality and equity will be matters of official presidential priority at the Brookings Institution from here forward, from here on. Today's event on systematic, systemic racism is a key component of that major effort with research also focusing on our Hispanic and Native American communities faith-based communities, including our Jewish and Muslim communities, as well as the threat of white supremacy and domestic terrorism. These are all gonna play a major role in this work. And this presidential priority will also focus on the importance and the need for comprehensive law enforcement reform to include reforms that are rooted in community participation and citizen commissions and strategies for shifting power to our local communities effort will not solve systematic racism and inequality alone. We have much work ahead of us, but in the world where we often spend more time debating the nature of the problem than taking meaningful action, we must find ways to contribute however we can and to move up forward together, to rise up together. Now, as I've said to many of my colleagues at Brookings and, and in recent days, we cannot remain silent about injustice. Inaction is simply unacceptable. We have to stand up and we have to speak out. And especially for those Americans who may look like me or who come from a similar background, that has to begin with our deep reflection and very importantly, our listening to the voices that will make a difference. It's also about elevating and supporting the voices of those traditionally underrepresented or even silenced throughout society. That includes dialogues on anti-racist policy approaches that, that both support the well-being and the success of our communities of color, but also actively follow the leads of those same communities and gives them the space and the opportunity to drive the national debate. We have so much to learn and to improve as a country. And many of the answers lie with our fellow Americans most disadvantaged by the current unequal and unfair status quo. Today's event is a step in that right direction. So with that, let me introduce our panelists for today who will discuss these and many other topics 
in the next hour. First, Camille Bassett. Camille is the director of the Brookings Race, Prosperity and Inclusion Initiative and is a senior fellow in governance studies with affiliated appointments in economic studies and metropolitan policy studies. Today's launch is a product of her leadership. And it's great to be with you, Camille. Thank you, John. Next, Makeda Henry Nicky. Makeda is a fellow in our governance studies program and was one of our excellent Rubenstein fellows. Her career and her research is focused on expanding equitable access to responsible credit and promoting policies that advance inclusive economic opportunities for disadvantaged fellows, families, and low-income communities. Welcome, Makeda. Thank you, John. And last, but certainly not least, Rashawn Ray. Rashawn is a member of our current class of Rubenstein Fellows, where his research focuses on mechanisms that manufacture and maintain racial and social inequality, with a particular focus on police-civilian relations and men's treatment women. He also speaks to ways that inequality may be reduced through racial uplift activism and social policy. It's good to see you, Rashawn. Let me close by saying that the Brookings Institution is committed to developing policy solutions on these critical features and issues and to helping policymakers and the general public alike find a better path forward, one that leads to healing, equality, and a sense of shared community for all. And it is my sincere hope that you will find use and value in our conversations today. But it's also my prayer that you are all today on this call, you are all safe and well, wherever you may be. And with that, let me turn the floor over to Camille with my very best wishes for a wonderful panel today. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, first, for the wonderful warm introduction, and then also for affirming the commitment of the Brookings Institution and your own personal commitment to ending racism, racial injustice, and the inequities more generally. I also want to welcome our online audience. I, you know, once again, I thank you very much for joining us. The moment we find ourselves in is a moment of distress and yet one of opportunity. It is also a moment that was hundreds of years in the making. There is not a single American who has not been touched by racism. Those of us who are on the receiving end are forced to adjust almost from birth our expectations that we will be treated with respect and dignity. Those of us who have not had to make those adjustments are also diminished by the fact that we are not able to enjoy the benefits of living in a world where our black and brown neighbors are valued and can achieve their aspirations. We are all affected. That is the message of the incredibly diverse and global demonstrations in favor of racial justice we are witnessing today. As John has mentioned, we have just launched a blog series, How We Rise, to focus attention on how we apply public policy to upend racism. In what will be the first of many public conversations on this topic, we, will, we are going to spend some time today discussing how we move forward. For, for the next 30 minutes, my colleagues, uh, Rayshawn Ray, Makeda Henry, Nikki, will join me in a dialogue about the path forward from this moment. And following that discussion, we will open the floor for questions from all of you. I want to express gratitude to those of you who have already submitted questions. We will try to address those questions as we move through the discussion. So Makeda and Rishan, I wanted to start the discussion by asking you, how should we be thinking about the local and personal impacts of police murders of unarmed people of color? Each of these people we mourn, both the names we know and the ones we do not know our brothers, sisters, parents, members of faith communities. So when we think of all the unarmed people of color who have been brutalized by the police, I wanted to get your reflections on how we should think about these brutalizations and murders as a community experience and as a community trauma. So I first wanted to turn to you, Rayshawn. So Camille, thank you for, for those remarks, um, as well as General Allen. You know, when I think about what's happening in America right now, and obviously studying policing, 
when I think about George Floyd or I think about Breonna Taylor and so many others who don't always get um, a hashtag, who don't always become these involuntary martyrs as some people call them. I think about statistics that really highlight people's experiences. The fact that black people are 3.5 times more likely than whites to be killed by police when they're not attacking or have a weapon. That's the experience of George Floyd. And I think his experience is emblematic of a continuum of police violence that oftentimes starts with what happened to Christian Cooper in Central Park, where Amy Cooper relied on historical racial tropes that are older than the birth of our nation, the, the movie, as well as the literal birth of our nation to actually victimize black people, black men in particular. And we've seen in that moment, I always think about imagine if police had showed up before Christian Cooper left that incident. And I think we also know from the work that I've been doing as well as our colleague, Nicole Turner Lee, like imagine if we did not have technology to capture what happened to Christian Cooper, to capture what happened to Ahmaud Arbery, to capture what happened to George Floyd. And it highlights the fact that every 40 hours a black person is killed by police in the United States. I mean, these are statistics that should really unnerve us all. And as I think about these, these health spillovers, as Dr. Sewell from Emory University and I just wrote about in the new How We Rise blog, our work highlighted the ways that these collateral consequences of police violence manifest on the lives of people who are oftentimes observing these incidents, as well as the ones who are left to pick up all the pieces after someone has been killed by police. I think Erica Garner is a great example of this. Of course, her father, Eric Garner, was killed in New York City on the street. Everyone's seen it. This is why we say, um, I can't breathe. And of course, we've heard that from George Floyd. We've even heard that more recently over the past several weeks from other people, in particular, black men who have been killed by the police. And so as we think about that, that moniker, what we highlighted is the ways that police violence manifest in local neighborhoods. We found two main things. First, we found, well, really three main things. First, we found that people who live in these neighborhoods, their mental and physical health profiles are worse than people who do not live in neighborhoods where police violence is there. And I know there are a lot of people who say, well, these neighborhoods just tend to not be as good in general. Not necessarily. I mean, we controlled for a host of factors and we still found that outcome. Second thing we found was that men who live in these neighborhoods, these men suffer, their mental health suffers in these neighborhoods, higher levels of depression, higher levels of anxiety. Third, and this is the big one, is that really these collateral health consequences collide on the minds and bodies of women, in particularly black women who live in these neighborhoods. So their, their physical health is worse, higher levels of obesity, higher levels of heart disease, and higher blood pressures relative to men, even controlling for a host of other factors. And this is because to what we know about, say, Congresswoman McBath or Sabrina Fulton and, say, Michael Brown's mother and others, is that women are oftentimes the one who become activists. Women are the ones who oftentimes become politicians aiming to change policy. That is a loaded weight to bear that oftentimes women take on. And it's part of the conversation when we talk about police violence that we don't talk about. These collective memories matter. And I think the reason why George Floyd matters so much is because George Floyd is literally our Emmett Till moment in a sense that everyone's seen what happened and people left changed. And so I know that we'll talk about this more, but I think when it comes to police reforms, I think it's a few things that we should talk about. First, as the, the Senate and the House of Representatives and people on both sides are putting together proposals. Obviously, the Democrats have already put, put out their proposals, primarily led by Senator Cory Booker and Congresswoman Bass and others. And the Republicans, led by Tim Scott, is putting out some proposals as well. What people have to realize is that body-worn cameras and implicit bias training and banning chokeholds is simply not enough. These are things that over the past five to 10 years have already started to become commonplace or police departments already have in place certain protocols or plans to implement them. That's not enough. That doesn't move the needle in terms of what's going on. Instead of what I've argued for is that instead of having all these policies focused on bad apples, we must focus on the rotten tree because those bad apples come from somewhere. And I think we have to restructure civilian payouts shift them from taxpayer money to police department insurances. I think second, we need to have a national registry 
that when officers are terminated for police misconduct or they resign when they are under investigation for police misconduct, this is one of the ways in which these bad apples proliferate and go to other departments, we need to ensure that they cannot work in law enforcement again. And then finally, we need comprehensive data reporting. Police officers want this, they like data, they wanna do their jobs better. And more importantly, comprehensive data reduces officer involved killings by 25%. Thank you, Rayshawn. Makeda, I wanna to turn to you and see what your reflections are on the collateral community damage associated with these murders. And don't forget to unmute yourself. Uh, thank you, Camille, I think for hosting this incredibly important conversation today. You know, uh, our default as researchers, right, is to cite statistics to support a case or prove, prove a point. But the trauma that Black communities feel defies statistical explanations. To me, it's personal, it's agonizing, and it's exhausting. Each violent murder intensifies our trauma. The videos of, you know, Philando Castile's brutal murder in front of a baby and Ahmaud Arbery's lynching transfixes us. They're fair. I feel it in that moment. You know, we instinctively reach out to our sons, our brothers, to ensure their safety because we see them in these fatal encounters. And structural policies ensure that our trauma, it's a collective, a, a collective experience, a community experience. You know, the infamous broken windows theory led to decades of police terrorism in Black neighborhoods and the disgraceful mass incarceration of Black men, one in three of whom in their lifetime will go to prison for simple infractions like riding a bike on a sidewalk. I know this because my husband was one of them. Thank God he escaped those collateral uh, consequences. Our present and, and, and future, you know, they're, as a community, they're linked because of concentrated disinvestment in neighborhoods where the focus was on locking Black men away at the cost of $36,000 a year rather than investing in Pell Grants to educate them. And as a result, you know, we've got college enrollments uh, for Blacks are dismally low across all institutions and skewed towards junior colleges. More than 50% of Black students attend community colleges or for-profit institutions. A lot of them predatory. This further exacerbates, you know, those income disparities. So when you think about this structural vicious cycle, um, you know, we've got to sort of con consider these multidimensional layers that textur uh, texturizes our, our community trauma. And it's, it's real. It's, it's economic, it's, it's social, and um, it's emotional. And because you know, of this sort of this structural racist past and our history, we experience, as, as Rashawn said, Amit um, writes all over again, um, George Floyd, Tamir Rice, and Laquan McDonald in unison. I think measures like a national registry, registry excuse me, make sense. But there are some other actors, including the financial services sector that I'd hope we get to in this conversation that are implicitly um, you know, a part of perpetuating uh, this trauma and these uh, structural racist outcomes. Thank you very much, Makeda. Um, I wanna build on what you both have said and um, talk a little bit about those unique challenges that come with uh, being in a community that has been traumatized. Um, when you are in a community that has been traumatized, um, that poses, I think, a unique set of challenges for eradicating racial injustice. It also poses, um, I think, a unique set of opportunities as well. Mm -hmm. And so I wanna um, turn to you, Makeda, again, to chat a little bit with us about how do we take these unique challenges that come from this type of tra trauma um, and address the consequences of longstanding racial injustice? Uh, I think it's important to kind of dress back a little bit and start with, you know, in my view, what's one of the critical challenges here. And that's the refusal to acknowledge that our trauma was systematically designed for this intended cruel effect long-standing social and economic oppression of the Black community en masse. So when white America refuses to acknowledge their responsibility for this racist system that conditions our lives, you know, we fail to account for this larger ongoing community trauma. And as a result, I think, you know, it, it, it stymies our ability to uh, produce some really transformative rehabilitative measures. And like I said before, identify the agents that are implicated in perpetuating structural racism. Um, sadly, this week, Larry Kudlow, uh, the president's economic advisor said he doesn't believe that systemic racism exists. So when I hear stuff like that, I want to say it's important to call out examples when we see them. Take the 2018 Farm Bill. When President Trump signed the 2018 Farm Bill, he perfected the definition of structural racism. That systematic coordination of public policies and institutional practices to perpetuate uh, racial inequity and privilege whiteness. Mitch McConnell led 
the, um, you know, the, the hemp agenda. Um, he went out of his way to remove hemp from Schedule One of the Controlled Substances Act, essentially decriminalizing hemp, but not cannabis. Cleared the way for hemp farmers to get access to USDA uh, farm loans and protected their crops under the Federal Crop Insurance Act. Meanwhile, this critical bill, as you say, that offers opportunities for farmers ensured that Blacks remain in place fully excluded in participating. The bill prohibits any person with a drug offense within the last 10 years from growing hemp or participating in a hemp program. According to ACLU, Blacks are 3.6 times more likely than whites to be arrested for possession, even though they use marijuana at the same rate. So what does that mean for black farmers who are 1.4% of the 3.2 million farmers in this country? Uh, the, according to the Pew Trust, they're resistant to farming this high price crop that's well suited to be farmed on small land uh, acres of land and in rows, which is their history. Uh, but because of this you know, association with cannabis and, and the war on drugs, it's an irrational reluctance. That's, that's part of the trauma that you know, we as a black community suffer from mass incarceration and police violence. Um, so because of this, you know, the farm bill will now largely benefit whites, both as employees and farmers. And like the days of redlining, um, there the financial services sector will provide loans, insurance, and other services that will play a consequential role, Camille, in you know, financing the systematic disadvantage of blacks as entrepreneurs, workers and landowners. Um, so I, I just want to sort of step back and say, in order for us to create opportunities, we've got to also attack the systematic constructs that are already in place and disrupt them um, in, in ways that are consequential and transformative for these, you know, for this generation, um, and as well as for the next three to five years, even way well before the elections come up. Great, thank you, Makeda. Rishan. Um, what unique, what, I just want you to answer the same question, you know, what unique challenges does community trauma from racism pose for how we address the consequences of longstanding racial injustice? I think one of the big ways, I mean, first off, I mean, <clears throat> what Makeda just said was excellent. I mean, ditto to, to all of that. These are the overlooked ways that racism matters in our society that we just miss, that we don't pay attention to. And part of the reason why we're using the, the term, as you all know, structural racism <clears throat> is because as Eduardo Benilla Silva is laid out, we don't necessarily need individual races for racism to continue in society. And it's, in, it's baked into our policies, our laws, our rules and regulations, as General Allen was talking about. One of the big things I think about is carceral grief, which is what Dr. Sewell and I highlighted. It's the ways that when there's state sanctioned violence, which oftentimes police violence overwhelmingly is, it's important for people to recognize that in only about 2% of um, officer involved killings or police killings, depending on which language people like to use, um, is an officer say even brought before the grand jury In only about 1% of those cases are they charged and even less than that, are they convicted? So we have to recognize that what's happening in Minneapolis is unprecedented for officers to be fired that quickly and charged that quickly. And I do think that that has changed from say five years ago where um, Marilyn Mosby stood in Baltimore and charged officers and I, depending on which side people were on, people cheered. What was interesting is all those officers were found not guilty and most of them are back on the street being bad apples proliferating across Baltimore with all the problems they've had. And so I think about when these things sort of impact communities, it runs a current through everyone who are in those particular communities. It impacts their mental and physical health. And I heard Charles, Charles Blow the other day say, think about how much more productive people could be if they didn't have to process these things on a regular basis and not have to go to work and put on a nice face. Um, my uh, roommate from college made a profound statement to me a week or two ago. And he said, he said I can't act like my insides feel He's a banking executive. He's saying, I can't go to work and fully express how I'm feeling in this moment because people are going to be threatened by me because even though I'm, ex I'm, I'm an executive at one of the major banking corporations in the world, I know that I still have some vulnerabilities based on my status, based on my identities. So when we think about what's happening in local communities, it really impacts people's health. And I think it's one another study that really highlights this. People looked at, scientists have looked at telomeres, okay? The length of people's telomeres on the end of cells shows how long supposedly you're gonna live. And when it starts out kind of people around birth or 
elementary school age, we see that the length is fairly similar across race. We also see that IQ or genius, however people want to define intellectual ability is relatively similar. But as individuals grow to be teenagers, part of what happens, particularly in impoverished neighborhoods imbued with, with violence, whether that be crime or police violence, their telomeres start to shrink. And research has shown that black boys in these neighborhoods, their telomeres are as short as elderly men. Like that is what the stress of living in violent neighborhoods do to people. And we have to be realistic that policing plays a role in that. Thank you, Rishon. Thank you, Makeda. Um, I wanna move a little bit to thinking about what's next. You know, we've been, um, we've grieved uh, the loss of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, most recently, as we've grieved everyone who's come before them. Um, now we're gonna be in a position soon to be thinking about, okay, what do we do in order to make forward progress? And so I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Um, Makeda, I'm gonna start with you. What does that agenda look like? Uh, well, first I'll say who should design that agenda. <laughs> That agenda, you know, fits me when I and my uh, fellow uh, Black women economists and Black male economists have a hand in designing that agenda, right, the Black and Brown communities of America. Um, I think a good place to start is the Black to the Future Action Fund. I, I love their Black agenda for 2020 that calls for critical legislations to be passed across the spectrum of uh, issues that impact our lives and uh, reinforce structural oppression. So uh, lowering uh, the, the Lower Drug Costs Act, now act, excuse me, by the late Elijah Cummings, and the Domestic Workers Bill of Rights Act. But beyond legislation, I, I want to charge, you know, I'd add a charge to it to charge the financial services sector, which has a key role to play in, anti in an, in an anti-racism agenda, excuse me, independent of public policy or any legislative changes. That sector can play a critical role in leveling the playing field and reversing decades of community trauma. The, Re the Community Reinvestment Act, I believe, is an important tool that the sector you know, has, it, has at its disposal to direct substantial flows of capital back to traumatized communities. And it's not perfect. And I agree with the critics of the, uh, of the critique, excuse me, of the recent CRA changes, but I still think the CRA could be used as a vehicle to deliver holistic investments. I'll say that again, holistic investments, not only loans to communities exposed to, to uh, police violence, but banks need to act. You know, instead of strongly worded statements filled with emotional rhetoric, I'd much rather see a CEO issue a blanket commitment, as I've written, to reinvest all fees and interest it receives from arranging the financing of municipal bonds used to pay multi-million dollar settlements of police misconduct. I'm sure that George Floyd's family in due course rightly so was settled with the St. Paul uh, Police Department, but the protests have made it clear that community trauma is so visible. It impacts us all. Rashawn spoke of the carceral grief. It's in our homes. Who pays for our healing? The financial services sector must recognize that community trauma generates these fees and they've got an ethical decision as to whether they should continue to pocket them. Thank you, Makeda. Rashawn? Yes, Makeda, yes. Um, I mean, I, I think about the importance of employing a, a racial equity framework, and that's essentially what Makeda is talking about. I mean, on the corporation side, and then I'll shift quickly to policing, but, you know, there have, all, there have been these hollow statements coming out from all these corporations, from all these universities. People are tired of getting emails. Say what you're going to do about it. So when I see a, a, a letter or an email coming from a corporation that I patronize, and they talk about how, oh, we just recognize that we don't have any diversity at our top levels. No, you didn't. You didn't just recognize it. You knew it before. Now you know that you're going to get called out for it. You're trying to do something about it. If you put in place a racial equity framework, you don't have to send out those hollow messages. So we need to ensure that there is diversity in terms of who's sitting at the table. Because, of course, as I like to quote Shirley Chisholm, if you're not sitting at the table, you're on the menu and someone's eating you for lunch. And I think that's part of what Makeda is saying is, who is aiming to compensate for that grief, that grief that just continues to happen and overflow? And then second, Black-owned small businesses, 
women-owned small businesses, Latino-owned small businesses, Asian-owned small businesses need to be in the subcontracting queue. We know from PPP funding allocated from the Small Business Administration for COVID-19 that all of these businesses were left out in the cold, continuing to get another hollow email and sort of blanketed apologies. We don't need that. We sort of need the types of, of policies that lead to more equality. I think on the policing front, I, I think it's a couple things I'll just say. I think one big thing I'll say is that I think at times officers are left out of the equation, but not necessarily in ways that people think. It's, it's not about officers standing up saying that people are attacking them. Well, you know, I mean, when you're beating people in the street who are trying to enact their First Amendment right, when you're pushing down old people and nobody's coming to their defense, when you're shooting homeless people in the head with rubber bullets who can't get up on the sidewalk, part of it is a lack of empathy and what many people consider to be um, immoral sort of decisions on their part. But with that being said, what I see in those moments are incidents where there are a group of people whose mental health is suffering. The research I've done highlights that about 80% of police officers report chronic stress. Interestingly, some of the same levels of stress that the people in the neighborhoods that they over-police experience. So in a sense, it's kind of like what happens, what do we tell kids? Hurts people hurt people. I think that's part of what's happening and the stereotypes and the biases come out oftentimes on black and brown people in ways that it doesn't in white communities, but it still comes out in white communities as well. And 90% of officers never seek help. Nearly 20% of them report suicidal thoughts. Nearly 20% of them report um, addiction. And so we need to ensure that they get the mental health services they need. I think, I think you just have to normalize it. Every quarter, law enforcement should be required to go to the psychologist or psychiatrist of their choice. And they should be able to do that. They need that. I think the other thing, they also need to be helped financially. They are underpaid, overstressed, and overworked. And the officers that I've studied are working 80, 100, 120 hours trying to send their kids to college, trying to send their kids to this school and this activity. And anytime you're stressed, you make bad decisions. So if we had housing subsidies, like we see on some local levels, like even though Philly's been in the news a lot, they have this program. Um, I know some places in New Jersey do, do as well. This improves community policing. It helps police officers to live where they work. And it hopefully improves the relationships that exist between police officers and low income, particularly predominantly black and Latino uh, neighborhoods. Well, thanks, Rayshawn, both to Rayshawn and Makeda. These are such fantastic suggestions. And I know they um, are gonna stimulate a lot of discussion in our Q and A. I also just wanted to add a, a few thoughts about an agenda as we move forward. You know, the long history of racism and inequity in this country um, has created tremendous distortions in our society. And those distortions are evident in the yawning racial wealth gap between black households and white households. The disproportionate representation of black and brown neighbors in prisons, the experiences that black and brown students have in school, the health and well-being status of black and brown neighbors so painfully highlighted by COVID-19. Those distortions speak to a culture and a set of norms practices, laws, and regulations that have many times intentionally, and sometimes not, led to an accumulation of challenges that require comprehensive and thorough redress. So the problem we have is too big to be overcome by any individual American. And what that means is that there are no actions that people of color can take unilaterally to alter this grim picture. In creating a just and equitable chance for communities of color is going to require something pretty massive. And I would say massive like a new deal. And that new deal I think has to tackle racism in all of its manifestations. So I'm gonna to say today that I think Congress, you know, with uh, the guidance of black and brown um, leaders and advocates, Congress in particular, will need to consider a robust package of measures that target generating good jobs, subsidize, um, subsidize educational attainment, invest in communities of color uh, and in healthcare for communities of color as well, that incentivize employers to employ and develop um, applicants 
black and brown applicants and that incentivize law enforcement to focus on diversion programs and risk-based policing. So I also think that the 2021 White House will also need to act. And again, with the guidance of black and brown community members, it will need, I think, to establish something like a federal equity commission whose responsibility will be to make recommendations to the president and his staff to marshal data upon which the executive branch can make decisions about the issues it wants to pursue, that can liaison with agencies to identify particular agency authorities that can be intentionally trained on remedying the impacts of racism, and um, also to interface with a, a um, variety of federal entities to focus on fiscal priorities relevant to eradicating the impact of racism. It has to be holistic. And I think the agenda just has to be, you know, jobs and income for communities of color. Uh, again, reforming police tactics, investment in black and brown neighborhoods and in well-being, eliminating deserts in healthcare and financial services, and incentivizing educational metrics that measure the degree to which black and brown students perceive themselves to be valued in the school environment. So I'm gonna, we, we have a few more minutes before we open for questions. And I wanted you, Makeda and Rashawn, to reflect a little bit on um, whether you think this is really an inflection point or whether we are gonna find ourselves in 20 years talking about the very same issues and challenges. So Rashawn, I'm gonna start with you. Um. So I do think that this is an inflection point. And, and I get that a lot of people don't necessarily feel that way. Um, but I'll tell you why from a policing standpoint. Now, obviously, I think what a lot is going to happen over the next month will tell us a lot, um, as well as whether or not this policy window increases. You know, when I think about policy windows, I think it's like a match being lit. How long does the match stay lit? Well, partly depends on the brand and the type of matches you have. And I think that's part of what we're highlighting, are we gonna have a short policy window that just might last through the summer while we're talking about structural racism or is it gonna continue through the first two years? I think that's gonna depend on whether or not uh, Biden or Trump wins. I think it's gonna depend on whether or not the Senate flips. If those two things happen, then I think we'll see an extension. But I think this moment is different, partly because of what I mentioned about how quickly that the officers were fired and charged. I think we can also look with Christian Cooper Amy Cooper was fired from her job. Her dog was taken for animal cruelty. In the Ahmaud Arbery situation, three people were charged. Doesn't mean they've been convicted yet, but I do think that these things are changing in Louisville with Breonna Taylor, the police chief resigned. I mean, these are unprecedented changes in law enforcement. And I think we have to be very clear about these particular changes and part of what's happening. And for people who wanna to continue to see equity, these are the things that needs to be doubled down on that as we look at what's happening in Minneapolis, I mean, you have the city council, well, first you have the police chief saying that he's not going to renew this contract discussions with the Fraternal Order of Police right now. That's huge. The Fraternal Order of Police plays a big role and they should be vilified in this moment, not only because the FOP president is seen riding around with uh, coats that have white supremacist lingo on it, but also because they were still teaching this, war this warrior style type of course that led to the types of chokeholds that killed Eric Garner and that choked out dozens of people in Minneapolis over the years. With that being said, I see this silver lining and I, and I think if policymakers can be pushed past banning chokeholds, adding implicit bias training, adding body worn cameras, these things are already commonplace. We need more progressive policies like restructuring civil payouts, like dealing with qualified immunity, which for people, people who are trying to make sense of that, is the fact that it simply means that when a, a, a peace officer, a police officer is engaging in behavior that's uh, covering them legally because they are doing their profession and they cannot be sued or held liable or culpable on the civil side. The problem is that that particular legislation has been interpreted to extend on the criminal side and it doesn't. So part of my proposal is going around this a bit and saying if we make a shift from taxpayer money to um, police department insurances, 
all of a sudden we'll have a shift in where the money's coming from. Instead of the general fund, like in Chicago, over $600 million over the past two decades. I mean, that's abhorrent. And imagine if that money went to education and work infrastructure on the south side of Chicago. You know what would happen? Crime would decrease. Crime would significantly decrease. Those are the two biggest factors in crime. So I think that moving forward, we do have an opportunity, but it's going to depend on what that looks like. Great, thank you very much, Rishon. Makeda? Um, I'm, I'm more pessimistic. I think we've been here before. I agree that you know this whiplash and uh, fast reaction to hold cops uh, accountable is promising, it's encouraging, it's uplifting. But I think we've been here before. You know, when Eric Garner was put on that uh, chokehold and we watched that video of him, um, you know, dying on the sidewalk for a pack of cigarettes. Um, the New York City Police Department banned chokeholds. Actually, it was banned before that, but he still, you know, died as a consequence. So I'm, you know, I think much depends on the election. Much depends on this Congress. Much depends on our local leaders to have the political will, and much depends on the private sector to get off the sidelines, get out of, you know, corporate, um, uh, you know, uh, CSR statements, and truly get to the business of advancing equity and reforms in this country. Without employers, without the private sector, jobs don't flow. We have 43 million people and formerly incarcerated people who spent years build, rebuilding their lives are at the back of that bus when this economy opens. The seat right in front of them are low income communities. So unless we sort of pull in the same direction when it comes at, at all levels, I'm just not sure that this is enough, um, you know, to sort of change things around. We're lucky that we were all sitting at home, not working, paying attention to the news uh, coverage. And the media too has an important role to play in how we, you know, move forward. Historically in all of our protests, I feel like this is the first time that all of the uh, media uh, houses are you know, covering the same protests in the same perspective, using the same language, you know, not trying to vilify the minority of looters, but really advancing this a peaceful protest, wanting change, wanting equality. We all have to be on board together. Couldn't have been said better. Um, I'm going to now trans, uh, transition to audience um, questions. And we are getting actually quite a few questions, as you can imagine. Um, so I'm going to tee up the first one, which is from Mike. And the general idea behind the question is, how do we go about um, addressing institutional racism in a country where um, there's often a zero sum perspective where people feel like if other people are gonna get ahead, then that obviously diminishes my opportunities to get ahead. So what, what, do, we, uh, what do we say um, when we're trying to encourage uh, particularly political leaders uh, who are going to have to be very courageous to explain that um, actually investing in undoing structural racism is a gain for everyone. So I'm gonna, uh, I'm just gonna toss it out there, uh, Makeda or Rayshawn, whoever, whichever of you want to take that, I'd be grateful. Okay, um, you know, I, so Andre Perry and I, we wrote a piece on reparations and part of it, and I, I really like how Makeda put this a second ago saying that people are using the same language and we see a shift in what that language does. Public opinion has drastically shifted, particularly in the past five years. And we have to give credit to the movement for Black Lives for doing that. I mean, I can't think of a social movement in a span of five to eight years that has been able to diversify to be able to get people on a similar page with thinking. And I think technology matters for that. But I think that is something that we have to bear in mind, that young people today are using technology, mobilizing and organizing in ways that, honestly, our ancestors could only have dreamed about. With that being said, we know that 75% of uh, people view what happened to George Floyd as a sign of something broader, okay? When the last time that happened, I, I don't even, I'm not sure if even marriage equality had a percentage that was that high, particularly the shift in the way it happened. So that is another part of the policy window that Senate Republicans are looking at the fact that over 50% of Republicans are saying something is wrong with law enforcement. We need to fix it. 50% of Republicans, I mean, that's that's astronomical. So with that being said, what, what is the messaging? Part of the messaging has to be synergi synergistic. What do I mean by that? It's the fact that in 1860, 
we have to be clear because part of what I recommend is reparations. I think that is one of the only ways to move forward. How, how will we get people to buy into that? Well, it's coming clear on what that looked like. In 1860, enslaved black people were worth $3 billion. Research has shown that that, and so there wasn't even their labor, that was just their physical bodies. Research has shown that that links to the racial wealth gap that exists today, where whites have about 10 times as much wealth as blacks and college educated whites have seven times as likely, uh, seven times more wealth than black college graduates. We also know with that being said, that black Americans are the only group who have been systematically discriminated against by the federal government who have not received reparations. Native Americans have received reparations. Japanese Americans have received reparations. Jewish Americans of uh, the United States has helped to assist to ensure that reparations for the Holocaust have continued. And so we have to be very clear about what this is about. This is about morality. This is about atonement. This doesn't necessarily have something to do about what one person did to another person in 2020. This is about the fact that the past links to the present. Great, thank you. Makeda, did you wanna address the question? I do, um, I'm, I'll be a little bit more controversial. I, <laughs> you know, when, we, when I think of answering these questions, I, the image of the Sankofa bird, bird comes to mind. Marching forward, but looking backward. And I think it's important to look backward some. A study came out of the Duke University last year showing that between 1940 and 1970, more than 60,000 homes in Chicago were bought through predatory contract deeds. You know what a contract deed is? It's a deed that a seller can hold the title, sell you a house, whether it is um, of good condition, habitable, and needs or, or needs to be um, demolished. You still have to make those payments. There's no protection, and um, and they are still able to uh, un un encumber that title and pile debt on. So essentially, when you finally take ownership of this home. It's worthless, even after all the money you've saved. Now think about 1940 to 1960. That's a pretty difficult time. In those times, that's a post-World War II era when the GI Bill came in and the white middle class grew. So I'm a little bit, you know, um, wary of these, um, you know, ideas that we now have to be a little bit more patient and ensure that white America feels that you know, we're not taking away. A lot was taken away. That study showed that three, between three and four billion dollars of home equity was stolen from uh, just Chicagoans alone. Um, I think what we need to sort of, um, and, and, and again, like I pointed to earlier, the 2018 Farm Bill is designed to do much the same. We need to trust that there is room in this economy for every single person without having to reassure those who've had before and had for a long time that we're not going to take too much from them. Our kids, our children, our future generations deserve part of this equity and wealth that we worked 400 years to build. Great, thank you, Makeda. Um, we're gonna get, we're getting some other questions here. So um, I'm gonna talk, uh, kind of shift a little bit and, and ask you, what are the, this is from Gregory, um, he's asking, what are the top two to three things that citizens can do at the grassroots level to bring about the necessary policy changes, irrespective of the party in power? Rayshawn? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I, so, so I think the, the biggest thing on a local level, I always think local, local and state. So people's municipality, their city, their county, and then the state. I think you first identify who is on the committees of the sort of things you care about. So for policing, for example, in every municipality, there is some sort of judiciary committee. These are the people that make decisions about law enforcement, about police misconduct and the like. You wanna figure out who in your local area that is in your area, whether or not you voted for them or not, that's irrelevant. You need to contact them and express your concerns and level up these policy solutions that we're highlighting here. I think there is another part, obviously, when I hear grassroots. I think people typically think organizations and that sort of thing. But I think for us to continue to move forward with dealing with structural racism in America, it means oftentimes having conversations with people who we love. Those are oftentimes the most difficult conversations. I've been seeing so many conversations, particularly with young people, because they're home, they're not at school, having conversations with their parents and grandparents, taking them to task for saying sort of things that are racist, that maybe our generation would have tolerated. 
young people who are teenagers, 20, 20 somethings, they're not tolerating that anymore, nor should they. So part of what we have to do is become racial equity brokers and racial equity advocates. This means having conversations for marginalized people when they are not present. It also means fully interrogating your rules, policies, practices, and procedures, as well as, as, well as the laws in the places where you, where you lay your head, so your neighborhood, the places where you fellowship at your church, at your kids' schools, at the places where you work, at the places where you exercise and engage in activities to ensure that the sort of policies that Makeda laid out are not still on the books. Because there are a lot of places where that's the case. I mean, let's take Georgia, for example. I grew up in Atlanta. I'm from Tennessee, but I grew up in Stone Mountain, Georgia. Georgia does not have a hate crime law. So even if people now is coming out with a mod Arbery that the, the youngest McMichael Travis McMichael used the N-word after he killed and what most people consider to be murdered, Ahmaud Arbery. Well, Georgia can't even deal with that. Like they, these become the kind of things on a local and state level that people can change by going to their state capital, testifying, working with local representatives. Thank you, Rishan. Um, Akeda, did you wanna address that? Uh, I'll just say one, uh, one thing. Um, I think at the grassroots level, protecting our democracy is essential. Voting is not a partisan issue. Voting is uh, your civic duty to get involved, listen to the issues, and vote for the candidate that represents your uh, uh, policy interests or your community interests. It's extremely vital to our conversation on equity, on reforms, that you, at the grassroots level, ensure that your neighbors, your friends, your network understand the understand the importance of, of, of voting and participating in our democracy, actively so. Great, thank you. You know, we're getting a, a question around um, uh, that, that basically is stating that um, minority companies um, are typically shunned by venture capitalists and angel investors. And what are the mechanisms from a policy perspective um, that can incentivize these investors to provide um, access to appropriate uh, and market-based funding for minority businesses. So I wanted to take that on because um, we have a colleague here in uh, at the Brookings Institution, Andre Perry, um, who has just published a book, which is called Know Your Price, Valuing Black Lives and, Pro and Property in America's Black Cities. Um, it's a discussion of investment in black neighborhoods. And uh, it also, um, and Andre's work in general has focused a lot on how it is you can funnel better investment into uh, black owned businesses. And so I would encourage all of you to take a look at that. Um, I wanted to move on to a, a question around um, uh, defunding of the police, which we know has very much been in the news. Um, there's also, Andre Perry has also published a blog on the How We Rise platform that discusses defunding the police but it's very much in the news. I do want um, to give Rayshawn an opportunity to talk about what do we mean by that? Um, and to suggest some resources that people could consult to understand a little bit more about what that means. Yeah, I mean, as you mentioned, uh, Andre and his colleagues just published a piece that people should read. Uh, Philip McHarris, who is at Yale in sociology, um, had a piece he was on MSNBC today discussing it as well. When people say defund, um, it sounds harsh. Essentially, oftentimes what people me mean is reallocation or reinvest. Okay, I also wanna do a reset. There's another term out there, um, abolish policing. Well, when people say that, there, there are some people who think we just shouldn't have law enforcement, but what really what most people mean is completely take out the rotten roots and rebuild. Because as everyone knows, if you plant something over rotten roots, then some of that stuff is going to continue to grow as well. So Camden is an example of where they completely start all over with their police department. I think Minneapolis will follow suit. There'll probably be others. But on the defund front, part of what it means is shifting resources. And there are a couple of fundamental reasons as to why people argue for this. First thing I know from my research is that only about 10% of calls for service for law enforcement deal with violent encounters. So that means nine out of 10 times, it's having nothing to do with violence at all. Now, that doesn't mean that it might not turn violent, that either the person who police officers are going to see might not might have a weapon or might do something violent. It also doesn't mean that police officers might not come and escalate it, which, which we've seen a lot. But the whole point is, law enforcement, 
police officers are doing everything from trying to figure out uh, where potholes are on a street to getting a cat down out of a tree. I mean, these are things we don't really need our law enforcement to do. And oftentimes they're responding now to calls related to substance abuse, calls related to people who are, who are suicidal. Could be argued that we need a mental health specialist to do that, that we need an addiction specialist to do that. The other thing, of course, the militaristic ways that law enforcement has happened, this leveling up with equipment is also something that a lot of people talk about. Throwing equipment at structural racism doesn't work. So body-worn cameras, in-dash cameras, um, all of these different things, it doesn't solve the problem. It's also on the bad apple side. What people are saying is look at the budget, take a market-driven approach to it. And so that could mean slightly in different places, it looks differently based on what's going on. But what it does mean is reallocating funding to social services, reallocating funding to education to work infrastructure. And I think is reallocating money for officers themselves to get them healthy. Because right now, many of them are not healthy when it comes to their mental health. Also, there can be housing subsidies. That would be better money spent to put people in neighborhoods. If you look at Washington, DC, police officers can't afford to live in Washington, DC. Police officers can't afford to live in New York City. They can't afford to live in Los Angeles. We want our law enforcement being where they live. So part of the defunding argument is that we need to divest, reallocate and shift funding and do a market driven approach, that would be my suggestion, to ensure that funding is used in the ways that's best for local municipalities. Great, thank you, Rashawn. Mikado, there's a question here um, from Gwendolyn, which I'm just gonna uh, summarize, but basically what it, it is asking is, um, how do we rise uh, spatially? And, that, and what she means by that is how do we change the ways in which Black people physically occupy space in this country um, and uh, culturally and aesthetically socially occupy space in this country. And um, I'm wondering if when we think about the ways in which uh, Black communities have been you know, de-invested, um, whether there is more that we can do to ensure that the kinds of investments that you talked about earlier um, really are targeted to making sure that we can all show up physically in any place we want to show up and therefore also show up culturally and socially as well. Uh, the only way we show up culturally and socially is if we are allowed to live in a neighborhood and claim it as a space for ourselves. So I would say remaking the spatial context uh, is very much going to be uh, determined by our affordable housing policy. I want to point us to uh, the inclusive communities case in Texas that was back in 2014, I believe, which argued rightfully that the low income housing tax credit program, <laughs> in essence, well intentioned to help us, you know, use the most, the cheapest financing available to construct um, um, affordable housing, which is extremely expensive if you're doing it at the multifamily massive scale, but it concentrates it in um, these housing uh, projects in uh, communities with high um, levels of poverty. In fact, it's a qual one of the qualifiers of um, our criteria to qualify a census tract is that it's um, a per perpetually poor um, a census tract. So going back to my earlier um, you know, response on how do we enforce change, we can't do it with you know, uh, incremental policy. It's gotta be bold. One of the bold things you know, we can do to remake space is to take a serious critical look at the, at the low income housing tax credit. We have to deconcentrate the, 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 the clusters of um, poor multifamily housing across this country. There, um, I think there's a case in New Jersey uh, called um, uh, Mount Laurel, which offers evidence of you know, putting um, the, reshaping the built environment to include low-income housing and not change either the value of uh, property assessments. In fact, property values in, in continue to increase over the 20 or 30 years that they fought and you know, they finally had that, um, um, they fought, but then they finally got that, you know, big project established and it made a difference. It made a, hu a huge difference. Uh, uh, Matt Desmond wrote, you know, extensively about this. In order to change the physical space, we have to build healthier communities that are integrated and cannot. We cannot continue to rely on institutional federal policies um, uh, to continue to pe perpetuate segregation. I couldn't agree more. And uh, you know, uh, we are almost at time, but I did want to offer my own thoughts on on that particular topic. And, um, and I wanna link it to an earlier question about what can individual citizens do? You know, one of the, the 
probably worst legacies of racism in this country is that space, both physical, cultural, and also historical has been highly, highly regulated in the US. Um, redlining is a great example of that, but so are signs that say no N word and no dogs, um, you know, loitering laws. There are just a range of ways in which we really try to regulate brown and black presence, physical presence in the United States. So one of the things I wanna to offer to folks is look around you. And if in your space, work, school, the neighborhood you live in, the grocery store you shop in, if you don't see black and brown people there, that is the place to start. So I just wanna thank our panelists, Makeda and Rayshawn. It has been fabulous having you on. I wanna thank very much um, uh, President Allen for making a commitment um, from the Brookings Institution on, on focusing on these particular issues of uh, racism, racial injustice and inequity. And I wanna thank all of you for joining us for this webinar. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.